Welcome to our worship service. I have about eight and a half zillion announcements, but I'm going to speak very quickly. No, they're, they're very important. First of all, though, Manuel, welcome. Joe brought a workmate, Manuel, with him. Good to see you, good to have you with us. Um, where's Jim and Rini? There's Jim and there's Rini. Welcome back. Jim. Sit down. <laughs> All right. Those of you who aren't familiar with, with Jim, um, they, they've been traveling a lot, but now that they're home, every, every Sunday when we announce uh, birthdays, he raises his hand. So you're probably not going to believe this, but this past week on Thursday, Jim actually had a real birthday, his very own. <laughs> and so <laughs> congratulations, Jim. And I understand that tomorrow is Paula's birthday, <laughs> right? Good. Any other birthdays, anniversaries? Linda and I had an anniversary last Wednesday, and it's an anniversary that um, we will long remember. <laughs> she sends, she's, she's recovering from, from knee replacement surgery, and she sends her love and her greetings and um, misses you. Some other things, the latest uh, copy of our Daily Bread is available. It's on the table in the foyer for October, November, and December. Um, the Wiggins this week, um, Kermit and Joanna, um, had a major fire in their area, and they were very concerned midweek that um, they may lose their ranch. It, was, it came that close. But the Lord spared their community their immediate community, and spared their hill is the way they said it. So that's a real praise. And, of course, there are so many people this past week and so many fires in California and Oregon and other areas and people in, in great distress that we need to continue to pray for. But thank the Lord for his mercy on uh, the Wiggins and their community. I have an update. Actually, it's a note from our Missionary Juanita Fike, she sent a note and said to you, thank you so much, fellow servants of Christ, for your continued donations to my UIM ministry account. I am so appreciative of your part in the ministry God has called me to. This is the year that I should have come over for an in-person report, but I haven't been doing much traveling. Um, do know, though, that I appreciate much the backing of Bethany Bible Church. As some of you may have heard, I'll be traveling to MO, that's Missouri, right? Um, with the Booths. In fact, they're not here this morning because they are taking Juanita to visit her brother. Um, and she goes on to say, to visit my oldest living brother and his wife and daughter. He will turn 90 on October 2nd. We had to cancel our family reunion this year, which was tough to take since being with my brothers is the highlight of each year. I don't drive those 2,600 miles round trip by myself anymore, nor do I want to have to take about six flights to get there and back. The Booth's offer is a huge blessing. I pray you are all keeping well. May we each continue to seek growth in Christ likeness. Love, Juanita. And one more, and this is from Nancy. It's a card for all of us. And those of you who are visiting, um, Don Brackett went home to be with the Lord, what, three weeks ago now? It has been that long, really, about five weeks ago. Nancy sends a card that says, with special thanks, this extra special thank you note sent to you today holds more appreciation than any words can say. For you're among the nicest you're among the nicest people I've ever known, and you'll never be forgotten for the thoughtfulness you've shown. Thanks for everything. Then she writes, dearest church family, there really are no proper words to express my heartfelt, express to you my heartfelt thank you to all of you for your love, kindness, and support to me and to my family for all that you have done uh, for us during this very difficult time. You have been such a blessing to us and I praise the Lord for each and every one of you. I am so thankful that I have such a loving family in you, and I know that Don felt the same way. He loved all of you, and one day we will be together again, uh, rejoicing with our 
Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Love always, Nancy. P.S. To God be the glory. I invite you please to stand. We're going to sing together and then remain standing. I've asked Dennis Lamazny if he will lead us in uh, a reading of God's word and he's going to read Psalm 8 and then lead us in prayer. So if you would stand, we'll sing together to God be the glory and then please remain standing. Good morning. We're reading this morning from Psalm chapter 8. <clears throat> o Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babies and infants, you have established strength because of your foes to still the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Let's pray. Great God and Father of, our, of us all, uh, we gather today to praise and worship and bring glory to your name. <clears throat> you alone are worthy of our praise and worship. Great are the works of your hands, O God, and great is your love and mercy for your children. Uh, bless this time of, of praise and worship, Lord. We dedicate it to your name. Amen.
Hymn number 269, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Father, as we bow before you once again in anticipation of you speaking to us through your word, I pray that you would impact our lives uh, very deeply and very powerfully in a way that transforms us more and more into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that this passage this morning will be very, very meaningful to us. I pray that your spirit would have his way in our lives. I pray that the deep work of your word will go forth unhindered by sin in our lives or unhindered by any sense of rebellion in our hearts. Father, that you would open our hearts to you, to your truth, and impact us deeply for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his sake. And in his name I pray, amen. Please be seated. And open in your Bible, please, to Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, verses 1 through 10 is our passage today. You will have noticed in your bulletin that you have a sheet that is virtually blank. I usually give you an outline. You do not have an outline this morning, and I'll explain why that is in just a few minutes. But I did want to give you the map that's on the back of that Um, sheet of paper and also some blank space on which you can take some notes if you would like to do that. Again, Acts chapter 16 verses 1 through 10. You know, one of the wonders of the Christian life is that we serve a God who is omniscient. That means he knows everything. He knows every situation in the life of every human being who has ever lived. And on a personal level, if you are a Christian this morning, by that I mean if you love him, if you've given your life to him, if you sought his forgiveness for your sins, he loves you and he knows what is best for you and for all of his children at any given point in our lives. And he has the power and he has the authority, and he has the love to provide what we need. 
and to do so in his own way and in his own time. But his ways and his timing are not always what we might expect or what me, we might desire. So one might conclude that since he loves us and since he has all knowledge and since he has all power and since he has all authority and since he is committed to doing what is best for us, that he would certainly provide everything that we request of him as long as our motives are pure and our desire is to glorify him. But in reality, he often says no. I've titled this message, When God Says No. You have experienced it if you've been a Christian for more than about a week and a half. God saying no to something you just knew that you needed or that you wanted desperately, not necessarily even in a selfish way. But we bring requests to the Lord often. And not always does God say yes. In fact, quite often, maybe even most often, he will say no. And while we may never understand why he would deny a particular request, we must understand that the same love and knowledge and power and authority that enables him to provide anything he chooses to provide for his children is the same love, knowledge, power, and authority that determines what is best for him to provide for us and how our individual requests fit into his overall plan, not just for us, but for his kingdom. Our universe tends to revolve around us. Have you noticed that too? But in reality, the universe and all that is in it revolves around him. For us, our request is just that, a request that we bring to the God whom we love. For him to respond to that request in any given way involves perhaps countless contingencies and ramifications as his answer to our request ripples through the overall picture. For example, if I pray for rain, let's say we're in a drought and I pray for rain, Lord, provide rain. He has to decide whether or not he's going to answer that. And in answering it, he has to somehow orchestrate the entire atmosphere to bring in rain. And what about those people who work outside and whom he loves? And if they miss a day because it rained, they're going to have a financial issue because they have to provide for their families and perhaps they can't afford to miss a day of work. And what about that outreach that was going to the local park? And how about Betty who's at that outreach and God's plan is for her to hear the gospel and come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ as her savior. And yet I'm praying for rain that will cancel that whole event. You see a little glimpse of the picture that God has to orchestrate to respond to our prayers. And he does that very well. But in doing so, quite often, he'll say no, or not yet, or not now, or maybe never. See, our responsibility and our privilege, really, is to bow to his sovereignty, to bow to his will, even though we may never know why he said no, or we may never know why he said yes. But we know that every prayer of his children he hears and he responds. So you see, ours is a walk of faith, and that's the walk that we've been called to. Now, why do I give you all of that? Well, just as a reminder, because we live in that sphere every day. We are dependent on God. We're dependent on his spirit. We're dependent on his word. We're dependent on his resources. And he tells us to bring all of your requests to me. Not to me. I can't handle my own requests, but to him. And he will decide what is best for us and for his overall plan for his kingdom and for all of his children. Paul understood that principle. And Paul understood it because quite often God said no to him. Now this is an apostle. This is an apostle, as you know, 
that was very instrumental in the spread of Christianity from Jerusalem all the way into Macedonia. And we'll see that on a map. In fact, on the back of your, your sheet of paper is a map that'll show you that geographical area. And we'll look at it in the overhead in just a moment. But the point being that this is a very important person, but quite often Paul said, or God said to Paul, no. He did that numerous times. We'll see it numerous times in today's text. Now, we, when we look at how God dealt with Paul, we can see that sometimes the Lord says no, and he says it by means of certain circumstances. For example, and you needn't turn there, but Romans chapter 1, verse 13, Paul says, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you, here it is, and have been prevented so far. What is he saying? God said no. I, I haven't been able to get to you yet. I want to get there. I want to have some fruit among you. I want to minister to you. I want people to come to the knowledge of the truth, to the knowledge of God, and I want believers to be built up. But so far, God has said no. But I've wanted to come to you so that I might obtain some fruit among you, even as among the rest of the Gentiles. But I can't get there yet. Sometimes the Lord's no comes by way of the latitude that he grants to the enemy of our soul, Satan himself. For example, in Thessalonians, this is 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 18. Paul says, we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, and yet Satan hindered us. Now, why would God permit that? He doesn't tell us, but he did. He said no, and he said it by means of demonic, satanic hindrance. But always when the Lord says no, and we need to understand this, when the Lord says no, it is for our increased wisdom, our increased spiritual maturity. Classic example, I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. This again is Paul writing. And he says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, now let me stop there. You know that Paul received special revelations from God personally. And then he communicated them to other believers and through his writings to us as well. He was given the power to do miraculous things, to heal and to do other things, to cast out demons and so on. Now just imagine if you had that power from God and you had personal one-on-one -on -one communication with God and he was revealing to you things that he hadn't yet revealed to anyone else. You might struggle just a bit with pride. Okay. And Paul was human. He was exemplary in his spirituality and his commitment to the Lord, but he was human. So he says, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations that I have received from God, for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. God was putting a governor on his pride. He goes on to say, concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And here's what God said. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. You know what God is saying to him? No. I'm not going to take this away. Because in your weakness, my power is demonstrated. My power is perfected in your weakness. How did Paul respond to that? This is what he said. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distress, with persecutions, with difficulties for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Sounds like a contradiction. But he's talking about physical weakness and humility and the strength and power of the Lord manifested through him. God said no, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you. Now, when we come to this morning's passage, God will again say no to Paul and to Silas. They're on the second missionary journey, and he will say no to them multiple times, and these no's will come directly from the Holy Spirit himself. We'll see that in the text. The setting is focused on Paul and on Silas as they begin Paul's second missionary journey. You may recall that Paul had a disagreement with Barnabas, who was his companion on the first missionary journey. 
And that disagreement revolved around Barnabas's nephew, John Mark. And Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them on the second missionary journey. Paul said, no, because he failed, he deserted us. On the first missionary journey, I don't want him with us. And, and the disagreement was so strong that they went separate ways and Barnabas took John Mark and they, they went off to the island of Cyprus and, and to go that route. And Paul chose Silas and he went a northern route. So now, because of the conflict, there are two missionary teams. So the Lord is using even that to be glorified and to magnify the ministry. Well, that brings us then to this morning's text. I think the best way to approach this text, and the reason you don't have an outline that I would normally give you, because this is 10 verses, it's a narrative, um, it isn't easily outlined, but I felt that it would be best for us to go through it verse by verse, just kind of in a, in a narrative way rather than a structured outline. And I think that will be easy for you to follow because we'll just take it a verse at a time. Now, before we do that, let's become familiar with some of the various locations mentioned in the text. And I call your attention to the map on the back of your note sheet. You've seen this map before, if you've been here before. This is the second missionary journey. And just, just to remind you, and pardon my back here, the journey started in Syrian Antioch, Paul and uh, Silas coming to Tarsus. That was Paul's home city. They went to Tarsus, then to Derbe and Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. These are cities that Paul and Barnabas visited during the first missionary journey. So now they're going back to strengthen the churches and, of course, to proclaim the gospel so that more might come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Then... From Antioch, this is called Poseidon Antioch because it's in the area of Poseidia. Then they traveled over to Troas, and from there they got what's called the Macedonian call. The Lord directed them over here. But, different map, a little bit closer. Along the route, here's Lystra, Derby, Iconium, up through the area of Galatia and Phrygia, and this no. The Holy Spirit said, no, you can't go to Bithynia. You can't go to the north. And incidentally, the Holy Spirit said, no, you cannot go down south to Asia. So they only had one direction left to go, and they went past Mycenae. You'll see that in the text. And on over to Troas. From there, Paul receives a vision to come over and help us in Macedonia. So they conclude that that is the direction that God wants them to go. And in fact, that is the direction that he wanted them to go. So that's the geographical territory that we will cover in this passage. So follow along now, please. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 through 10, as I read it. Paul, and he would be together with Silas at this point. Paul and Silas came also to Derbe and to Lystra. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted to take this young man with him. So he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. They passed through the Phrygian and Galatian regions, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go to Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. And passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Ten relatively short verses, but there's so much in there, so many interesting and important details and principles. So let's walk through it together. And I won't pull everything out of it, but I do want us to see some of the key things that would also apply to our own lives in terms of God directing our own lives. Verse 1. Paul and Silas 
came also to Derbe and to Lystra. You may recall that during the first missionary journey, it was at Lystra that Paul and Barnabas were first worshipped as gods by the pagan crowd, and then some Jews, some, some Jews who were antagonistic, to say the least, came into town, won over the crowd, and they stoned Paul, dragged him outside of the city, and left him for dead. Now, the fact that that happened there, and now Paul, along with Silas, is going back to that city, tells you something about the level of Paul's love for these people and the commitment Paul had to the gospel and the boldness that Paul had in going back to that very location. So Paul's determination to return there is very significant. It tells us much about his character. The text goes on. And a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek, and he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. This is the first mention of Timothy in the New Testament. And as you probably know, Timothy went on to be a very significant figure in the New Testament account, very close and trusted and beloved companion to Paul, and the recipient of both first and second Timothy in the New Testament. But this is the first mention of him. And what we know about him is that, first of all, his mother was Jewish and his father was Greek. His mother was a believer. Apparently, his father was not. We know that his mother's name was Eunice. We know that from 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. And his grandmother's name was Lois. We also know that Paul commended both of these ladies as women of sincere faith. And undoubtedly, it was Timothy's mother and grandmother that influenced him greatly toward embracing the God of Israel. And so by the time he heard the gospel proclaimed, his heart was already prepared, and he embraced the gospel. It, apparently, it was Paul who led Timothy to the Lord during that first missionary journey. He isn't mentioned in the scripture with regard to that journey, but he was already a very mature and well-known believer by the time Paul and Silas came into town on the second missionary journey. And if we follow it through, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul refers to Timothy as my beloved and faithful child in the Lord. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, he refers to him as our brother and God's fellow worker. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he refers to Timothy as my true child in the faith. And then in 2 Timothy chapter 1, he calls him my beloved son. Now we know that Timothy's biological father was Greek. Paul was anything but Greek. He was Jewish Hebrew all the way through. So he wasn't Timothy's biological son, but he was Timothy's spiritual father. He wasn't his biological father, but he was certainly his spiritual father, his beloved son, his true child in the faith. So verse 3 then. This young man was so exemplary in his commitment to the Lord that Paul wanted to take him on the rest of the missionary journey. Verse 3 reads, Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him. Now hold it. Now, what's that all about? We know from our former studies, especially chapter 15, that Paul and Barnabas and others went down to Jerusalem to settle the question of how Jewish does a Gentile believer have to become to get saved? In other words, do they have to adhere to the Mosaic law? And that Jerusalem council was all about deciding, no, Gentiles do not need to be circumcised. Gentiles do not need to become Jewish. Gentiles do not need to adhere to the Old Testament law because the law was fulfilled in Christ. Faith in Jesus Christ plus nothing equals salvation. But now Paul is taking this Gentile believer and circumcising him. Why would he do that? That may seem contradictory. But if we go on with the verse, we'll see that it's not contradictory at all. He does that because of the Jews who were in those parts, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. This was expediency. This had nothing to do with salvation. He was already saved. He already believed the gospel. He already loved the Lord, but he was a Gentile. Actually, he was half Jewish. His mother was Jewish, but his dad, the significant role in that culture, was Greek. And everybody knew it because he, he, Timothy, was so well known in the area. 
that would present an, an, an offense to the Jews and would stifle Timothy's ministry because he wouldn't have um, access to certain areas of ministry or certain levels of ministry. And so for expedience sake, and because of the Jews that were in that area, to give Timothy entree into the Jewish community without offense, Paul circumcised him. And obviously, Timothy consented to that and understood that he was doing this for the sake of the gospel. So Paul's action really is consistent with his own approach to evangelism, and he gives us an insight into that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 20, Paul says this, I am free from all men, and yet I myself, and yet I have made myself a slave to all, so that I may win more. To the Jews I became as a Jew, so that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not myself being under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. You see, God did not require Timothy to be circumcised, but so that he might have greater access to the Jewish community, he did it. For the same reason Paul is saying, I'm free, but I make myself a slave. To the Jews, I become as a Jew, and so on. For the sake of the ministry, that's what's going on here. What the Jerusalem Council had affirmed was that submission to the Mosaic Law was not a requirement for salvation. And again, Timothy's circumcision was not a salvation issue. It was for usefulness. It was for expediency. It was for the sake of the gospel. Which brings us to verses 4 and 5. Acts chapter 16. Now, while they were passing through the cities, now it's Paul and Silas and Timothy. While they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon by the apostles and the elders and were in, who were in Jerusalem for them to observe. In other words, they were taking a letter from the Jerusalem council explaining that Gentile did not need to keep the law of God in terms of the Old Testament economy or to be circumcised. And they were taking that letter and proclaiming it to all of the churches along the way which was a great joy to them because they didn't want to be bound to Judaism. They wanted to be bound to Jesus Christ. In fact, in Acts chapter 15, verses 28 and 29, which brings us right back to the Jerusalem council, they reported in part, and I'm quoting here, part of their letter, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. This is what you should do. That you abstain from things sacrificed to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. If you keep yourselves free from, these, uh, from such things, you will do well. Those are things that would be abomination to an Orthodox Jew. So for the sake of Jewish ministry, for the sake of not unnecessarily offending the Jewish people, the council said, here's what you should do, not for salvation, but for your witness sake. And the Gentiles read those and said, yeah, that's good. We'll do that. So as the churches, comprising mainly Gentile believers at that time, heard the council's letter, they were relieved, they were rejoicing, they were encouraged. And that brings us to verse 5. So the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number daily. The gospel was going forth and many people were coming to the Lord. Verse 6. They passed through the Phrygian and the Galatian region, I showed you that on the map, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. This is the first time the Holy Spirit himself says to them, no, you're not going there. Now, now we could deliberate on that and question that and wonder why, but the fact is, for his own sovereign purposes, he said no. And the reality is, if they had diverted to either to the north or to the south, they perhaps would never have gotten to Macedonia. And Macedonia was absolutely crucial for the spread of the gospel. Certainly there were people to the north and to the south who needed to be saved, who needed to hear the gospel. But God wanted them in Macedonia and in Greece and in Corinth and all of those areas that are very, very significant. So they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia, that would be to the south. Now again, the map, just to remind you, Galatia, the Phrygian area, 
no, you can't go, we'll see in just a minute, they couldn't go north to Bithynia, they couldn't go south to Asia, so all they had left was to go to Troas, which is exactly what they did under the leading of the Holy Spirit. Now, verse 7, after they came to Mycenae, they were trying to go north to into Bithynia, and the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. So this is the second time the Holy Spirit said, no, you're not going to do that. Now, notice the change of descriptives from verse 6 to verse 7. In verse 6, the Spirit is referred to as the Holy Spirit. In verse 7, Luke, the writer of Acts, refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus. Now, what's that all about? Well, the significance of that really isn't all that significant. Apparently, there's no significance other than that of associating the Spirit with Jesus Christ. I'll show you what I mean by that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, and don't turn there, just, just listen. Peter proclaimed that Joel, the prophet, prophesied, saying... And it shall be in the last days, God said, I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. God said that. So the Holy Spirit is rightly called the Spirit of God. You follow that? Still the Holy Spirit, still God the Father, but the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God because God says, I will pour out my spirit. Jesus told his disciples in John chapter 14 that the Holy Spirit would come, and he would come in my name. So the Holy Spirit is rightly called the Spirit of Jesus by association. Same Holy Spirit, same Lord Jesus Christ, two persons. We're talking about the triune God here, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Okay. In Romans chapter 8, verse 9, Paul refers to the Holy Spirit as the Spirit of Jesus. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 19, he refers to him as the Spirit of Jesus Christ. In Acts 16, verse 7, it's the only place in the whole New Testament that he is referred to as the Spirit of Jesus. But again, it's association. It's the same Holy Spirit, Spirit of Jesus, Spirit of the living God. Verse 8, And passing by Mycenae, they came down to Troas. So the Spirit of God had prevented Paul and Silas and Timothy from going to the south and going to the north, so they kept going west and ended up at Troas. That brings us to verses 9 and 10. After having said no twice, the Holy Spirit finally says yes. And he did it by way of a vision. Verse 9. A vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing and appealing to him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now, I want you to notice something interesting about verse 10. He has the Macedonian call. Verse 10 says this, When he, that is Paul, had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Notice the we. Notice the us. What, what's happening here? All of a sudden, Luke, the writer of Acts, is with them. How did he get there? We don't know. But he's there. Now he's writing in the first person plural rather than second person. They, them. Now it's we and us. He has joined them. And this is significant because this now is Luke writing about first-hand experiences and observations. Okay. This isn't the only time in the place of Acts where he does that. We call these the, the we passages of Acts. I'm not going to read them all, but they're in chapter 20, 21, 27, 28. He refers to we and us. So he's with them, and then he's not with them, and then he joins them again, and, and never explaining how he got there or why he got there, but he was there being inspired all the time in reflecting back on this by the Holy Spirit. We'll study those passages as we work our way through the book. But their existence gives additional credibility to Luke's account of Paul's journey because he was there for parts of it. Well, what do we conclude from all of this? 
From this passage, we learn that God, through his Holy Spirit, determined the path that Paul and Silas and Timothy were to travel from Syria all the way over to Macedonia. Sometimes the Holy Spirit led them by saying no, by forbidding them to go to certain regions, to certain locations. Other times he led them by saying yes. For example, opening the doors of opportunity through a vision or through other means, through circumstances. Now, you understand that was a unique period of time in history and in the history of the church. And of course, Paul and his companions were uniquely directed by the Holy Spirit for the ministries that God had called them to. If we fast forward to today, believers, you and I, if you're a Christian this morning, have what those early believers did not have. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit. We have the inspired word of the living God in written form in the Bible. They didn't have that. It was still being written. I'm talking now about the New Testament. Obviously, they had the Old Testament. But that was a unique time. God directs us today through the knowledge and the application of biblical principles and by the empowering of the Holy Spirit to live accordingly. As we pursue the Christian walk and as we seek to make decisions based on biblical principles, often God will say no to us. Quite often he'll say yes to us. But we must remember that although we may never understand why he would say no, the same divine love and knowledge and power and authority that gives him the ability to say yes and to provide whatever his will determines for us is the same love and knowledge and power and authority that is applied when he says no, because he knows what is best and he alone knows what is best. And he's working out all of those contingencies for all of his children and even providentially through th for the whole universe. And because he's God, he can, he can handle all of that. And again, it, for us, it's a request. For him, it's a, okay, how does, how does this fit in? He fits it in nicely. It never puzzles him. But he's at work in an area and in a way that we really can't even begin to fathom. We get glimpses in his word. And we see traces in our lives. But we will never, even when we're in eternity, in his presence, we will never understand the full picture. We'll understand far more of it, but we won't understand the whole picture. But he knows what's best for us. And in the words of the psalmist, the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord gives grace and glory. No good thing does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man who trusts in you. So trust him, even when he says no. Please bow with me. Father, we praise you, the God of the universe, the one who gives more than what we need. So often you give because it delights you to do so, and you know it brings us joy. We thank you for the gifts you give to us, and we thank you for those that you withhold from us because you have the bigger picture. In fact, to say that you have the bigger picture doesn't even touch it. You are the bigger picture. All things are for you and for your son, Jesus Christ. You created it all. You govern it all. You rule over it all. You orchestrate it all. The fact that we can even come to you with our request is beyond our understanding. Why the God of the universe would care about us and yet you do more than care. You love us. And you've sent your only son to die so that we might be saved from our sins. Father, thank you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.